No. Okay. So I'm going to introduce uh, first of our speakers, which is Professor Naomi Murphy. Um, she's clinical director of a FENS unit at, at uh, the prison at Whitemore and has worked with men who have offended in the community um, and the criminal justice system. Thanks very much for inviting me along to speak to them. I particularly feel privileged as a, as a woman and you might question what I might know about men and boys and their mental health, but I would say I've you know, been qualified for 24 years and about 90% of the people I've worked with have been boys or men. And I, would, I suppose I just wanted to start with a couple of, a couple of quotes section. The firstly, from a name in that we don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. And the second from Roberta Bellano, that people see what they want to see and what people want to see isn't always the truth. Just wanted to start by talking about perception and the fact that um, what we see isn't necessarily always the truth. And a famous psychologist, Ro uh, Roger Berkman, highlighted how the actions that we choose to take are dictated by our perceptions. If our perception's wrong, then what we, the action plan that will come from that is unlikely to be helpful. And I think the fact that we're talking about a crisis of masculinity, that our mostly male prisons are bursting at the seams, three quarters of people who commit suicide are male, and three quarters of people with a substance misuse problem are male, suggests that even after many years of highlighting the sex differences, we still haven't got to grips with why, which might be because the perception that we're bringing to try and resolve these problems is perhaps distorted. And maybe we need to take a fresh look to gain a new perspective. Firstly, I'd like to share something about how my own perspective has been, has been shaped and what's caused me to question the narrative. And I've worked with teenagers and men that together might represent the two extremes of masculinity within society. So I've worked with young men in Young Offenders Institutes, jointly developed the first mental health in reach team into a male prison. I was tasked with developing a treatment programme for so-called untreatable psychopaths at Whitemore. I've assessed fathers in child and family proceedings, and I also have a, a successful private practice treating very successful overperforming CEOs and businessmen. And today I wanted to focus on this last group and also the untreatable psychopaths, because I think these two extreme groups share, and share a surprising amount in common. And I think the key to successful work with them has been an ability to look beyond conventional wisdom and see if there's another perspective. So I think Martin will talk more about the discourse of, of um, in relation to men, but I think we're all very familiar by now with the idea that women in prison are a traumatised population and that maybe prison isn't the right solution to what we do with women who've offended. With men, we're fed a constant narrative that crime is inevitable, that they're born with genes for violence, that they're born with a defective psychopathic brain, and also that masculinity is so damaged that we have to teach our boys why it's wrong to rape. And today I'd like to invite you to see that the mental health of men in prison is really not so very different from women in prison. And I have worked with women in, women who offend both in prisons and in hospitals. And I think there are actually multiple points in life where society could be strengthened to stop crime becoming inevitable or to prevent suicide from being the outcome. We collected some data in the FEN service on what we know about the history of men in our service. And by the time, because we are the kind of like last chance saloon for men in prison, by the time men come to our unit, they've typically all been assessed on multiple occasions by a probation officer and by a psychologist. And many of them have multiple reports. So we have an idea about what their history is when they come to us. And yet six months after they've been with us, we see a statistical significant increase in the kind of disclosures that men talk about, which are typically disclosures of vulnerability. And the men are highly resistant, I would say, to sharing stories about their vulnerability, about trauma early on in life. And mostly men take much longer to talk about that than they take to talk about their offending. And we also know that some men take much longer than six months to disclose. So. I mean, I do have, I can share the data on, on slides afterwards if, if it's useful to people. But of our population, we know that at least 73% have experienced physical abuse. 81% have been physically neglected or emotionally neglected. 81% have been subjected to emotional abuse, so active denigration by their parents, mocking, humiliation, ridicule. 
66 percent have been sexually abused and um, i think they're really interesting they've often been abused, sexually abused by multiple perpetrators not just one individual so it's happened at multiple points during their childhood and of those 66 percent of those 52 percent have been sexually abused by a woman during that time 44 percent have been have witnessed domestic violence 53% were spent periods in local authority care, 77% were bullied during childhood, 16% identify themselves as being raised in poverty by not having enough food to eat, not, not having adequate clothing, and not having things like washing machines. And another interesting number, I think, is that 20% were encouraged to engage, were pressurised by older peers to engage in violence or crime. And the stories that you hear in prison are not dissimilar to the kinds of accounts that you hear of um, the girls in the Rochdale and Rotherham child abuse cases where they felt like these older peers were befriending them and they were offered money and incentives to engage in criminal activity. Um, but I think it, you know, look how hard it was to see those girls as being victims, and yet they were clearly being sexually exploited. And I, we hear the same kind of stories about boys and these men, or significantly older peers, um, pressurising them into criminal activity. 16% have been sexually assaulted in adulthood, and 37% have been assaulted in adulthood. And probably also worth mentioning that a large number of them have been expelled due to acting out behaviour. In childhood so we, we know that the boy who ends up in prison is most likely to have been born to a young mother often a care leaver or someone with a history of abuse herself and so they've been exposed to poor parenting themselves and rarely have they received parent their parents received parenting support and we know that kids learn how to regulate their emotions from how they're parented so if their parents didn't get good parenting it's hard for them to know how to respond to their own children Better educated children might observe differences in their peer, peers' parents, but when families are characterised by poverty and multiple problems like substance misuse amongst the parents, they often find themselves sitting on the margins of society with very similar peers. So they're kind of sitting in a subculture where they see that that kind of parenting they've been exposed to as normal. And the other thing that we know is that boys are far more vulnerable than girls. So boys, boy children are much more likely to die from the same illnesses as girls. And alongside that physical vulnerability, boys are much more likely to bear the brunt of violence. So par some parents won't hit their daughters, but they will beat their sons because they see that as being somehow acceptable. And with, within private practice, the kinds of experiences that the men that I've worked with have come, they've again, they're coming with stories of emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, witnessing domestic violence, sometimes early boarding, and they're not typically coming to seek help themselves of their own wish to do something about it. Quite often they're there because they're experiencing marital breakdown and their partner's issued an ultimatum that they must come for, for therapy. And they, they describe current problems of things like substance misuse, overwork, um, perfectionism, infidelity, domineering and bullying, and an excessive focus on their work life with very little ability to make use of their leisure or family time in a way that's productive or meaningful. So in terms of barriers to change, I think we have a real issue as, as in British society of the denigration of masculinity. So we've allowed this notion of toxic masculinity to take root. And I'm not questioning the notion that society is largely patriarchal or that we have a problem with sexism. However, when you front load the noun masculinity that applies to one sex with a term like toxic, what implicit message does this drip feed to boys? We know that self-esteem has a big role to play in mental health. So how does this slow drip feed of discourse about toxic masculinity helpful for boys? I think we suppress stories about women as dangerous and overemphasize the stories about men as bad and dangerous. So I was pleased to see from your notes that you're aware that a third of domestic violence victims are male, and yet the overwhelming majority of hostels for um, domestic violence survivors are for, for women only. Male boys can be can live in these hostels which are staffed by women well what does that what message does that give to these boys so men are dangerous 
um, too dangerous to have any contact with. Um, so what implicit message are we feeding the boys that are um, spending time in these hostels? I think we've also had a real problem with lack of positive male role models. So I think family breakdown is inevitable on occasion and I don't believe it's desirable to encourage people to stay together just for the sake of the children. But it's important that men are supported to maintain a relationship with their children and that we find ways to provide them with a range of male role models. So more primary um, teachers who are male, mentoring schemes, youth clubs. These are the gaps that these older boys, um, young men, are stepping into when they're offering bribes of cigarettes and money um, to run drugs or engage in other crimes because these, these boys don't have the appropriate role models to look up to. And finally, in terms of what could change for the better, I think we could be willing to hear about the vulnerability of boys and sadly it, it feels like we're not. Whenever I present the data on the traumatic histories of men, I always get asked, how do you know they're not lying? I really don't think anyone would be asking that if I was talking about female prisoners. I think we need to be more curious and rely less on assumptions. So the kind of um, judgments that I've read in reports uh, have been about, about men have been things like, oh, he was raised within a normal working class family. Well, in that particular case, the normal working class family consisted of a separated par separated parents who'd both moved their current partners into the house and the children were all sleeping in the living room so the parents had their own bedrooms. So that, that's not a typical working class family. So there is something about being uh, appreciating the level of um, disturbance that is in some families. I think we need to engage in more balanced debate about the sexes rather than depicting women as being idealistic, nurturing, nourishing and not capable of abusing, which sadly isn't, isn't the case. Women are capable of all of the same things that men are capable of. And I think we need to create ways for all people in society to feel they matter and belong. And I think boys are encouraged to act out their distress, which is why you get the kind of like the aggression and boys are much more likely to get expelled than girls, which of course then leaves them very vulnerable to being brought in looking for other other ways to fit in and belong and when you're looking at things like the um the problem with um religious fundamentalism and terrorism in prison you're talking about men who are trying to fit in and belong and find a group that's offering them some way to participate i think we could invest more heavily in parenting skills and make sure that people know what it takes to be a parent and we should be prioritising the creation of loving, caring environments for those who can't be cared for at home. I read a Ofsted report recently, was, which was on social media, which was a really glowing Ofsted report about how all the children in the home, home felt really loved and cared for. Sadly, that isn't the reality. And we have men coming into our service and talking about for the first time in their lives, they feel loved and cared for. It's a pretty sad indictment that people have to commit a gross crime like rape or murder and find themselves in a high secure prison to feel that they belong somewhere or to feel that they're loved and cared for. And finally, I think we should be investing in finding ways to create male role models. Thank you.